Hola, eh, bienvenidos de nuevo a las conferencias dentro de, del Máster de Diseño Gráfico Elisaba. Esta ya es la, la penúltima, digamos, dentro del, del primer posgrado que estamos haciendo ahora de Diseño Gráfico Aplicado a la Comunicación. Queda una más que será a principios de febrero, seguramente ya mañana o así os anunciaremos. Pero bueno, hoy eh, no necesita tampoco mucha presentación, pero está con nosotros Rory McGrath de OKRM. Y nos va a hacer una presentación de, del trabajo de los últimos años. Y me ha pedido que especialmente le gustaría mucho si hoy hubieran muchas preguntas cuando acabe de hacer la, la conferencia. ¿De acuerdo? Gracias. Le damos la bienvenida. Um, can ever, just, to, just to start, can everyone hear me okay? It's really a pleasure to be here in Barcelona under these circumstances. It's a city that I've been to many times over the last few years, and, and it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting uh, me, me to El Asaba. Um, I think before we start and, and introduce uh, OKRM, which I'm here to represent, um, just a little about the title, The Common Thread. I mean, for us, um, It's a perfect title to start to explain the series of projects that we'll kind of go, I'll go through tonight. Um, it talks about this idea of a, a theme or characteristic which is found in, in various um, stories or situations. And, and these situations are really very much part of what graphic design is about. However much um, We have control over what we do as designers. One thing that we cannot control is the situation that we're placed in, who we end up working with ultimately. We can have certain clues, but one thing is for sure is that we're um, doing our best within a given situation. And what we at OKRM try to do is find this kind of common thread. Um, so just to introduce uh, ourselves, I mean, obviously I'm sitting here, but my absent partner is Oliver Knight. Um, The OK and the RM is Oliver Knight and Rory McGrath, It's very much um, founded as a partnership. Oliver and I met at, uh, in Bristol and we studied together for three years and we started to collaborate from a, a very um, early start in a, in a way, maybe before we even knew the true nature of what sort of graphic design was. Um, and our idea with uh, OKRM was that it, we would be able to collaborate um, and sustain our activities together as a, as a studio and therefore hopefully at that time we said hopefully be able to create um, a, a livelihood through our work and be able to sustain that. Um, and I, I guess now that, uh, this was in 2008 we started OKRM and now in uh, 2016, this is eight years later, we start to see that there is a, a, a common thread in what we do and, and it seems to sustain a, a, a good environment for us to um, To work. Uh, the second image, in fact, it's kind of out of date now. We now have five people. We have an extra person working with us. But um, from those, the beginnings of Oliver and I working together, now we have a, um, two, two designers and we have a project manager who, and we create a, what we think is a decent team to uh, encounter these various situations. What we'll do tonight is just to take you through um, a series of, of projects. Um, I'll try and explain a little bit about each of the projects, but more or less I'll try and move through quite quickly just to give a sort of sense of what those uh, relationships are in our work, what we're interested in and how one thing in a way leads to another. It's not necessarily chronological, but it talks about different kinds of projects that, that occur within our studio. I always um, like to start talking about this project. This was the first thing that Oliver and I made when we started the studio. Um, when anyone starts a studio, it's really the beginning and you think, okay, you know, what are we supposed to actually do? Uh, you have to find a, a kind of method. And one thing that Oliver and I are always passionate about is, is words and um, finding, in a sense, um, something essential within a found content. So we, we found uh, several words that are published every year within the Oxford English Dictionary, which I think must be international, must be different countries have different words that are introduced to the vocabulary. And what we did here is um, 
we, uh, just to play the animation if it works, let's see, is we took those words and we started to work, we started to try and create meaning through those in a way to sort of legitimize those new words and think about uh, making sense of them. So, for instance, uh, cookie cutter was a word of 2008 and putanesca became a word in the English language in 2008. Um, big whoop became a word in 2008 or hell's a poppin'. Um, so if you ever play Scrabble, you can certainly use those words legitimately in, in England. Um, and what we did is we just combined those into sentences. And this created like the beginning of, of what we called in other words, which we'll return to at the very end of the, of, of the series of projects, because uh, we've recently revived it. Something that, that we'll do, I'll do through the talk is to try and explain each project in a kind of fundamental sentence. And I think that, in a way, backs up our interest in finding a kind of common thread through things. This was somehow inspired by, but I would say, truly, we kind of found out about Sol Lewitt a little after we started to, to write sentences about our work. But Sol Lewitt is a, um, one of our favorite artist, as many graphic designers find, it's that he's an amazing artist and also like completely graphic. But he always explained every project he did as a sentence. Um, and in this case, it was geometric figures and all their double combinations, which ex is exactly what it is. So as we move in, we explain this is a, an identity for an exhibition that shows works inside and outside of the gallery. And some of these projects um, occurred at the beginning of the studio and we started to try and find a way of um, discovering our kind of underlying conceptual agenda, which more or less is trying to find the inherent meaning in things that we're dealing with. So this was a show in a gallery where art was installed inside and outside of the gallery. So the identity for the show ended up being a, a drawing of that space, the square representing the space, and the crosses representing various works which existed inside and outside of that space. Or if we talk about a guide for a series of events about a day in the life of a notable architect, we would talk about um, Le Cabusier, and this was a, a show at the Barbican Art Gallery. And in a way, it wasn't really a project. We kind of were asked to create something for a, for a days of activities, and there was a, a small amount of budget. This was at the very beginning of the studio, and we thought about a, a book which each of the spreads would represent an hour in that day and Cabusier had a very busy day of activities. So each of those days would then represent um, an activity and as you complete an activity you would get a sticker and therefore the book would become accumulation of those uh, events if you completed all of them, all 12 hours of them and therefore you would have a complete catalogue. Just moving through, we'll slow down a little bit but just to give you a sense of some of the things that we dealt with at the beginning of the studio. So a book object edition that derives from a billboard about it, which sounds rather complicated, but in fact it was. Um, so Jonathan Monk is an artist which we've since worked with a lot. Um, he likes the idea that others that he works with somehow complete his projects. Um, and he commissioned us to make a, a billboard which would become a book. And that was more or less the only brief we got. So what we started to think about doing is um, making that billboard a royal size. So it, the billboard, in fact, was a royal, royal basically paper formats in the, in the old days of imperial measurements in England were always given these beautiful titles. So royal was a, a format. And every time you folded that format, again, it became another kind of royal. So a 16 o was folded 16 times, or a quattro, in, you know, and so on, an octavo and eight times. And um, if you see the beginning of the installation shot, what we've done is, in fact, folded the billboard down into those different book objects. So the, small, the mo more it's folded, the taller the book gets, and the, um, um, you know, it creates a different series. And importantly, and it's really strange projects in a way, but importantly, these were like sold as artworks. So it's a sort of set of artworks which we ultimately made. I think it's important, as we, I need to remember to talk as we go through about form, because it's something that we often get uh, criticised about, is we don't actually talk about graphic design. And tonight I was thinking I must remember to talk about the actual design of things as well as the ideas. Um, 
I think that the reason we don't talk much, as much about um, form is because we're so, so obsessed with maintaining an idea in our projects. Um, but there's always a form and there's always a kind of strong form. Often we're relating our form to history. So in the case of this project, it's because we had this royal idea and it was very much about British uh, history, printing and bookmaking history, we chose to use um, times and every sort of different version of times. And we also chose to use blue because it's royal blue. It's like the official colour of the, of the Kingdom of Britain. Um, so we, we try to make formal decisions also so it's somehow based on the logics of the projects. Um, but it's not always the case. I mean, in other cases, for instance, in Beyond These Walls, the first project with the crosses, it, we sometimes rely on a kind of elementary constructivism or a kind of default uh, simplicity when there isn't a need to bring in some other historical uh, content. So the first few things we'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about, I keep saying we, you'll have to excuse me for that, it's just that usually I speak with Oliver, so, um, our, our books, um, and then we'll move into some other scale of projects, but um, this is a book for an artist who arranges soft objects on hard surfaces, and of course Gabriel Curie does like much more than that, but I guess this is part of the common thread is we're trying to find a fundamental um, in, these, in these different situations, and when we met Gabriel, he told us, the book that you're going to make for me must not be uh, a, a, an absolute mess of content. He'd made a series of books before and it, they were almost unedited. So what we wanted to do is work out how to like, create a kind of ultra edit. So each part of the book object is uh, a different part of the essential aspects of a catalogue. You have the, kind of, the curator's text, you have the plates of the exhibition, and you have a series of references or like, in a sense, context of where the artist is coming from. Um, and this principle of, of soft objects and hard surfaces is something that Gabriel kept saying, in a way surreptitiously, like through the course of trying to explain his work, he kept returning to this idea that he essentially arranges objects. Arranges objects. Um, so we did, we did just that in the case of this book. Or in another case, it's really about a collection of images or citations and references that support and inform the creation of five selected artworks. And Footnotes to a Project um, was made um, a few years ago now, but it was, a, it was a project that a curator came to us with. And this curator was um, used to doing what curators ideally do, which is selecting artists to come together and under, a, under a certain idea. The unusual thing about this project was the artist had been selected by somebody else and as a curator her job was to try and make sense of, of, the, of that fact. But she didn't really understand why these artists were brought together in fact, they seem, it seemed almost random. Um, so what, we, um, what she did is come to meet us and in a sense is what people do, these are the situations you find yourself in but they come to you and they say please help me make sense of this. Um, and through a kind of evening of, of, of wine and discussion, we decided that together that this thing needed to be a separate, um, it needed, there needed to be a separate work to explain the fundamental of what this was. Um, and what we thought was the, a book would do that perfectly. And this book could be a kind of footnote to the project of the uh, exhibition of these five artists. Um, and in doing that with a book, by doing a project like in this way with a book, what, you, what we did is create a kind of democracy of the different artists in one form. So, and usually you work with artists to create books, or, or at least artists know that you're making the book about them when you start, but in this case none of the artists did. So we decided to, um, to kind of create a kind of, almost a little bit like an architect would create in a museum, we create a space where each of those artists would have exactly the same amount of pages to express their idea. And it, there would be a democracy, as I said, so each would have exactly the same amount of pages. And within those pages, they would be able to fill as much, as much of that space with anything they wanted, essentially, that led to making the artwork. So, um, sometimes these things were pretty random. They were reference or, or research. 
Each of those things was then numbered and then would relate to a text at the back. So I'm getting quite detailed now, but you, it's important that you get a little sense of what, what the, why the form is what it is. Importantly, the, the bookmarks, which are a really in, a useful graphic device, are, are there purposefully to create a sense of reading images or reading words. So those two sides were very much split. And in a sense, the, the, the well, in a sense, in, in definite, the thing was a success because the artists, what they felt was pretty similar. They didn't understand why they were put together in the same space and they were very happy that they had an opportunity to share something that they felt was essential to the artwork. So I guess this for us was a, a successful project because it talked about how a designer can like bring um, another opportunity, another uh, reason, um, not just to form but another reason to, to practice or to work with those others that we work with. Just getting into exhibition, I mean, our studio makes, makes various kinds of work. It's in the same way we don't necessarily attach ourselves to a particular formal process. We don't really attach ourselves to a particular medium either. And I think that's maybe common for graphic designers these days, is we have to be a little uh, adaptive to various mediums. So we design essentially like all kinds of stuff, anything that comes our way really, like from books to exhibitions, identities, websites you know, merchandise, it, it's, it's really, really broad and, and I think that's something that we um, really enjoy in, in our work. Um, and exhibitions are something that we started to deal with in the last, say, couple of years. <coughs> Designs of the Year was one of the first times we had to deal with an exhibition and it's something that occurs every year at the Design Museum where they select a series of different objects um, f to review, essentially, as, as the Designs of the Year and they're from all over the world. And the thing with those objects is often they're put into, th this is one of those objects which is a little 3D printed, uh, 3D printer machine. And they, these objects generally when you go and visit this exhibition seem to make no real sense why they're in the same space apart from someone thought they were a good design. And it's really troubling to us like as visitors of this exhibition how like much of a clash there is between these objects and how um, how basically that barrage of content makes it really difficult to know what something is. So what we did here is try to like really clarify. So what we tried to do is label everything as essentially as it could be in a way to bring it down to its most basic um, reason. So this is essentially an affordable desktop 3D printer. However much the guy that designed it wanted to say it's way more than that, it really is just that. And that created a, a, a kind of very workable and satisfying method that everything in the exhibition could be labelled. So, for instance, I think this is the gourmand on the left, for example, is, is simply a journal of food and culture. Or, you know, this is simply a three-legged chair for Oxford students. Or this is a light that creates a space. And what that did is kind of create a sense of continuity within the show, which, which is what we were really aiming to do. Um, but it also linked, in a way, the, the, the reason why the Design Museum would profile these designs. It, it helped uh, the museum kind of work out how to communicate the essentialness of why a Design Museum should kind of exist. A new life for a church. I mean, John Porson, who designed this church, I mean, literally he explains this church in a kind of essay and it's like completely complex. But basically it's a regeneration of a church and it's therefore a new life. Or an ecological city car. And I think that this is kind of nice because in a way these sentences and these sentences somehow are really part of the same way of us understanding the world we're in. Um, and trying to make sense of it, which is um, really what our studio is kind of, kind of about in its essential form. Um, so here an identity for an institute that ex explores the potential of public space that's constantly redefining itself. The institute is constantly redefining itself. And this is Strelka Institute and it's, it's a mammoth project to discuss because it's, it's been part of our studio for like the last five years. Um, it's an institute in Moscow and it's based 
r right at the very centre of Moscow in an old industrial uh, island. It used to be a chocolate factory and various other kinds of factory. And the weird thing is that in most of uh, European cities, the factories were always like really on the outside, on the periphery. But in Moscow, because of the, the revolution and, the, and, and communism, essentially, it was always understood that industry should play a vital role, vital role within the city centre. So you felt like it was the heartland of, uh, of, of the economy. So Strelka is part of that island. Um, Strelka is um, an institute that, like I said, it's constantly redefining itself. It started as an institute for media architecture and design. It was founded by um, a group of individuals who wanted to re and redefine, in a way, the future of Moscow and the future of Russia. But also they wanted to give a sense of what, what is possible within the urban space. They called on Rem Coolhouse, like really early in the project, to define an educational program. And they had branded, like, I think the year, year before we started, they'd branded, but basically this was their identity. It was Strelka and Helvetica, which is uh, adequate, but didn't really express what they wanted to express. So when we arrived at the project, they were hoping that we would help them communicate who they were. And in a sense, one of the main problems was that Strelka was always the powerful entity, like this word, and all this other content that they dealt with, the people that came to visit, the lectures, the <coughs> workshops, discussions, conferences, were always at another level. So one of the first things that we, we did, which seems kind of obvious, but was really essential to the identity, is democratise the content. So everything that Strelka did would be exactly the same size. This, these are all kind of extracts from the presentation that we gave, actually, at the very beginning of the project. Another thing that we did was, was work out... Um, well, they, they'd always expressed to us that Strelka is an institute based in Russia, but with an international agenda. So the idea was that um, they were, at that point, sometimes communicating in Russian, sometimes in English, depending on who the lecturer or the person was that was teaching at the institute. But what we said to them is that they should always be completely bilingual, and that way they're always communicating with an international agenda. The problem with that is that when you put Russian Cyrillic alphabet next to Latin alphabet, there's a real um, uh, lack of continuity because the Cyrillic alphabet is, is based on small caps and lowercase. So there's this um, uh, difficulty. So we made another very objective decision to say that, OK, let's put everything in uppercase. So these are like really essential decisions, but um, quite powerful ones. The other thing is that they, which I've already said, but they, they kept saying to us, is that they really don't know what they are. They're redefining themselves all the time. So they were the Institute for Media Architecture and Design, but we said, if you're really defining yourself all the time, why are you not the Institute for whatever? You know, the reconsidering public space in Moscow or Institute for exploring trends in urban, uh, urbanization and de-urbanization or rethinking Russia in a global context of the free market. You know, these quite powerful, massive things, but they were sure that they were also an institute that was doing that. The other thing, I sort of use this word democracy kind of loosely, but the Russians at that time were like very obsessed by democracy for good reason. I mean, they'd had like no democracy for, for in their kind of contemporary history and kind of still don't. And they really wanted this institute to represent what was possible in a public uh, condition. And there's about 12 directors, so all of those different directors could feed into this, this idea. The other thing which we felt was important was to kind of give a sort of sense of like the place. And we drew this diagram, which is pretty abstract, but gave us a sort of tangible sense of how to handle an identity. Like, A basically represents, like, the institute and anything that represents the institute. Like, the level B represents things which are kind of temporary or kind of come to the institute. And C represents this idea of uh, sort of discursive content, things which are um, said in a moment or uh, things which are collected from, from content in the, from the institute. And then we had to work out how to represent those different conditions. So A, we knew needed to be a big motive. 
So we suggested that uh, it should represent public space, and in the centre of the institute says that there's this courtyard, and there's a grid that represents, um, there's the, the courtyard is kind of a grid of different concrete tiles, but we felt like the grid would represent this idea of a kind of shared space. And then these other contents could then just slip into that, that space, all at the same size, all at the same width of the grid. So in a sense, there's this like visual democracy. As I make it sound so pragmatic. In a way, it, there was also like a lot of like other ideas going on at the same time, like which were driven by our ambitions as designers. You know, like should it be, you know, um, Russian looking, or should it be, wet, you know, English? You know, what does this thing even look like? And I guess by finding this kind of ultra pragmatic approach, we kind of were able to like just be ultra objective about the form. It kind of, in a way, invented its own form. In a sense, we kind of uh, opted out of the decision to like create form. Um, this Institute for language became like super critical. It still is really critical for the Institute. And as we started to roll through like the various aspects of the identity, it all started to sort of fit together. Like the different, the idea of the two languages and then being divided by grids was really workable. There was clearly like different content that was passing through the identity all the time. It was kind of easy, that was another thing, is that the identity, ultimately we were going to manage some, or try and continue to manage some expressive aspects of the identity, but other aspects of the identity were going to be handled by an in-house team or other designers that we had no idea who they were at that time. So we needed to make it um, usable and kind of efficient as well. One of the, the, the most successful things we designed, weirdly, and it's still going on, is these flyers for club nights. And like literally it's a system where you can just drag the coordinates to different parts of the grid. Um, and the guy that runs the bar like makes his own flyers, so we're quite, quite pleased by that. Another aspect of the Institute which was really fun to work with was um, the publishing platform. And in a way that wanted to be like somehow related to the Institute but not really like the same language. So um, we started to design these, these different covers um, and try to express some aspect of the contents of each of the books. Somehow with a grid principle but also with a little bit of an um, you know, artistic license. We also brought in another typeface to the, to the table which was Lazerski and basically Lazerski has a really nice story in that it was used for all culture publications during the um, communist period. So it felt like a really nice um, story and a nice typeface to keep, keep going in a way, to keep it connected to, to, to Russian culture. There's so much to say about Strelka Press that I don't really want to get into it, but, but basically Strelka Press was like part ebook, part print on demand and if any of you ever have to deal with that, you'll know that it's a complete headache. But, you know, it's all about usability. It's this idea that, um, in a sense, rather than designing a book cover for, like, print, you're kind of designing an icon. Because that little t t book is often seen on, like, your bookshelf, your digital bookshelf. Or it could be seen in, like, Amazon. Or, or this book cover tends to be used a lot for, like, advertisements and so on. It's, it's like... So you kind of need to think of the book cover more as a kind of identity, like a micro-identity. Um, yeah, there's a lot to say about this, but you can kind of sort of see the different conditions that it has to exist in. Some of those are like really pleasant, you know, and they give a sort of beautiful sort of digital tension with the traditional design, but um, at the time it didn't feel like that. It just felt, honestly, it felt like a, quite a headache to deal with. Um, I th but I think we dealt with it quite successfully in the end. There's some nice things too, like the advertising of the books was handled all, all in this kind of way. We sort of em embraced this like digital essence. And then since then, um, there's been so many projects as part of Stroker, but the Institute's kind of taken on its own personality now. Um, we've got, we hired an a art director to be like in-house permanently. Um, Anna, who she's like super great designer and just totally embraced the, uh, the identity. We, we still work with the Institute. We worked as creative directors for two years 
as a kind of like full, sort of a full-time position, but shared between our studio. So we were sort of very much involved. I mean, um, this is like certain animations. It's a shame there's no soundtrack. There's a nice soundtrack to this too. But this was all about urban routines. So the routines that happen within um, our environment. And we drew like a, a complete alphabet of different symbols, which then the students could use to, to express ideas that they had about urbanism and so on for that, for that curriculum. This is like a year's, a year's curriculum. This is on our website too with sound, so maybe you could look at this later. But it's really quite fun. We also made this coat. This, this coat is like uh, kind of the nicest thing we do. It's weird to say, but it's kind of the nicest thing we sort of designed in the whole time, like the whole five years, because it was this. Like, basically, there's a fashion designer that we got to know through going to Russia quite a lot. And she's just awesome and really act, really fun, fun girl. And and she she kept saying, we need to make something. We need to make a, a piece of fashion because everyone loves Strelka. Like everyone wants to, you know, be part of Strelka. And um, so we worked with her on this coat. We made it in Russia. It was super stressful because basically making anything in Russia is like just like just doesn't work. Um, this coat, in fact, doesn't even do up. You can't really do it up. It sort of pops open by itself. But that's sort of part of its charm. But it became a big hit. So, like, now in Moscow, in the scene that surrounds the school, like, everyone has this coat, and it's, like, it's a thing. So we were really happy about that. Um, what is this project now? Sorry. Okay. So, identity is a big thing for us. I mean, Strelka, the, the thing about, hopefully, that you get from this, and we can hopefully have some questions at the end and talk a bit about it, is that a lot of these projects run simultaneously. So they kind of have a similar um, idea somehow and a similar method. They happen maybe at the same time. And Strelka identity somehow informed how we handle identity in general. Like, we always treat identity like very pragmatically at the beginning and then try and create flair once it exists. You know, it's a bit like the, the relationship somehow between architecture and building the building and then the curator coming in and doing something great with it in the case of an art museum or something. Um, so this is an identity that we, we maybe made about a year ago, or actually less, less than a year ago. And it's uh, AB.C, which is a real gift. Um, but basically, it was called Antenna Books. And then they wanted to start to only exist online. So they became antennabooks.com, which sounded terrible when someone wants to call themselves their website. So we, we suggested to them that maybe they should be an, um, the initials AB.C, which is uh, you know, obviously like very great, because you know, it's ABC, and everyone. <laughs> Everyone uh, gets it immediately. And that, that created an instant um, sense that everything that Antenna Books does should be primary. And that really, Antenna Books distribute like most of the contemporary art books and design books, not design really, more like art, contemporary culture. Like certainly in England and maybe now a lot in Europe too, they're becoming like really important for a lot of small publishers and, and maybe bigger publishers too and magazines and so on. Um, and their, their whole attention is really on one hand being really efficient and, and making sure that they're offering really good service because oh, there's so much to say about this too, I don't want to divulge, I'm definitely divulging, but in general, book distribution is a nightmare if anyone has to get into it. It's, it's um, very, very difficult for small publishers to get the money back from distributors. But Antenna Books really want to make sure that, that that ecosystem works like really well. And they're really generous to publishers in that they actually pay them. Um, they also want to create a sense of culture or at least have some sense of culture. So we did these postcards, which are like crops of books to help create an expressive aspect to their identity. So basically, if you're ever creating a purchase, you basically get a well, you don't get this many boxes unless you've ordered a lot of yeah. books. 
but it would be awesome if you did. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is clearly a big order. Um, and then you get the tape, which is a nice uh, link to the... The idea is that we will always... Well, maybe not always, but in the first instance, we just riffed on the ABC. So Africa, Bauhaus, car. And then you get this really nice little package of things with the book. So you get like the postcard ABC, you get a kind of crop of a book and a, with a caption, and you get your receipt in a little wallet, and then you get your purchase. So it's like this level of effort, which is really important to Antenna, but at the same time, the website, which we designed, is really very much about efficiency. The idea is that the website would be a kind of tool. Um, it's, the design was really inspired by you know, the software that we all use, the user interfaces that we get used to, and the idea would be that you kind of get used to this interface and therefore you, you rely on it, like we rely on Photoshop or Illustrator or any of our other um, interfaces. And it's really simple, it's a field of books. You can click into one of those books and, uh, and see the book more clearly and you can add it to your cart. Or you can click in any of these coloured strips. So yellow is, is, um, is about antenna, pink is the cart and green is the search function. Um, I, I should put my hands up and say that we had an email last week from Antenna Director saying that they might need to put in some words into these coloured strips. <laughs> 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 Which is totally, totally a bad idea, clearly. <laughs> because, you know, you, the idea would be that you get used to it, right? And you create, create a relationship with it. And part of uh, your love of it is that you discovered it. If you make it obvious, then it just becomes standard and therefore decorative that these things are, are present. Um, and these, these, these details for us are like really important because, you know, we're, hopefully we're trying to change the way that people understand the world, right? I mean, you know, that's us as graphic designers. That's what we're, we're there for. If we're, you know, hopefully. Um, so... This is another identity that plays in a similar way to this like ultra-functional aspect, but uh, this is a multifunctional and utilitarian visual identity for an art fair based in Miami. <coughs> We've just finished this, in fact, the first time I'm, I'm going to talk about it, and so there it might be a bit, a bit rough, but um, it started off this idea, I mean, I should, this slide's maybe more important, but it's called Untitled, which is a tricky title because in a way, anything you design with Untitled should be so, well, we felt so undesigned that it therefore feels untitled. Uh, yet the, the client at the beginning of the project wanted lots of design, you know, they want to be like an expressive art fair. So we had to find a kind of logic. The logic at the beginning of the project was to find something which would handle the, the basic visual identity or basic logo type. So we went back to this idea of an art caption because the word untitled, most of the time we, we uh, encounter it, is within a caption. So this idea of like you always have the name of something like Richard Prince or then you have its medium and then you have what it is and, and when it was made. And in a sense we tried to do something similar here. So it's, it's the name, it's kind of what it's made of, uh, you know, where it is and, and when it was made. Or when it is, you know, you, you get it. <laughs> we knew that the default direction, honestly, we'd really have liked it to look like this, you know, because that's it, clearly. But we knew that there needed to be another level of design, you know, a level of um, recognisability, because an art fair is essentially a commercial endeavour that should be recognisable and ownable. Um, so what we did is we created a, based on a very simple alphabet, in fact Unica, we created a distinctive version of it, being driven, a lot of the decisions here were driven by the sense of how do you make something even more functionalist than, than it was before, if that makes sense. It's just, it's, go, it's going back to the roots of functionality in a way, to the roots of modernism and to this idea that mathematics and constructive form played a really defining moment in simplicity and essentialness. 
And therefore, when you use this new alphabet that we created and, and write a sentence, you have an identity. Which again, I make it sound like really simple, but of course we had like loads of nightmares about how do you actually create something uh, neutral and distinctive. One of the main things for Untitled, again, was that it was this ultra-functionalist idea. Like, so many art fairs, and I'm sure you guys see them all the time in your own environments, they try to be kind of evocative. They try to create a kind of identity that is about something else, in a way linking itself to art. And often done amazingly well. Like, for instance, uh, the identities for Freeze Art Fair, for example, it, it's amazing. I mean, it talks about the idea of uh, a park and, and you know, a fair in a park, which is an essential idea. But then after a while, it starts to become this art artistic idea about what else is in a park. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the identity. And I guess we grew up with these kind of art fair identities, and we got bored by them because, you know, in a, in a way, they start sort of overselling themselves. And we really wanted to make an art fair that was like just about a product. It was like a space that you go, the art, art which is really what an art fair is. It's a, a really good service. It's really clear. It offers uh, um, great communication and form filling and uh, all of these UX devices that we spent a lot of time doing. You know, it offers these, these, these services to the artists, uh, sorry, the exhibitors and the clients of the fair, the buyers, the VIPs. So it's kind of dry in a way because it's really, um, it's really functionalist. Um, but at the same time, we kind of, what we did is, is we kind of chose this ultra exaggerated scale to everything. So you get this like strange relationship with this like uncanny functionalism, you know, like in a way like overtly functional. I hope that makes sense. But I think we wrote a sentence about this, which might be good to read, but we talked about the idea that, the imp as in art as well, but the implicit is made explicit. Um, and an idea is often explored by more reflective moments of conceptual art. It's a little bit like the way that uh, Andy Warhol took a soup can, made it big and put it in a gallery, and therefore you, you overtly understand this commercial artifact more than you did before somehow. And by dealing with this um, digital identity offline in a digital way, you start to, uh, to get this uncanniness. So all of the ads were, in a way, uh, based on the UX, the user interface, user experience. And the first ad's on the right, the second ad's on the left, and it's a, a little bit like the ad scrolled up. So you see, like, it sort of goes up to the next piece of information. So the idea would be if there was a series, you could kind of keep scrolling, right, the ad. These are just, like, conceptual methods to, you know, make decisions. And the bag became um, a kind of form-filling device, which was really, you know, a big hit in the art fair. Bags are really important at art fairs. Or the guys that worked at the art fair became like search icons. Which makes sense, because you've got to find them, right? And you, you know, ask them a question. And you know, everything else was just really, really, wow. Everything else was just really, um, really big and really clear and really functional, which is exactly, in our opinion, what it should be. Like, in the end, who wants to go to an art fair and see signage that looks like someone designed it? In the end, you know, you just want to read it. So captions and, and all of those basic elements were just really, really clear. And sometimes it's okay. I, 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 I kind of almost feel like it's making a, a like it, to say to everyone, it's okay to be like that simple, I guess. Because as designers, you, you sit down and you have to design a caption for an artwork. You're like, I've got to design it. You know, it's got to be like amazing and it's got to look like something. But actually, it really doesn't. It's just got to be, if it's just right, then it's 
really nicely designed. You know, it, if it's in the right place and a nice shade of grey in this case, I think it, you know, it makes sense. Um, so just returning the last couple of projects, but just returning a little bit more to the maybe the more f um, fun side of our. I mean, this is f identity is fun too, but these these are more temporary projects maybe. Um, this is a play of three acts that raises raising questions about participation within a national arts institution. It's it's based in the V&A in London, which hopefully you've all been to at some point or will go to because it's really amazing old school arts institution. They asked us, they have this project um, where the architecture designer and, and um, the architecture and design team called it, um, and now I'm forgetting, um, which is terrible, what's it called? Uh, all of this belongs to you. So it's the idea that the institution is public, which we all forget because most of these institutions sort of act a little bit like you can't do, you can't hang out in them, you can't be free in them, but in England these are literally government run and therefore taxpayers pay for them, it's like dem democratic space. Um, so it was about drawing the attention back to that. So they, the curators came up with this idea that they would create a series of events in the evenings and they would invite different participants, architects, designers, artists to make a project to draw your attention to the fact that you own this space. Going back a little bit to this idea that um, unless you have an idea, unless there's a problem, how do you have an idea? I, I guess this is something about our common thread, but we're really, really stuck unless someone gives us a real problem. I mean, it, we don't have like an investigation ongoing into form, so if something isn't clear, we can't just rely on our form, you know, our, our kind of pattern or our investigation into just typography to, to, to uh, fulfill the project. We kind of need more. So in this case, there really wasn't more. I mean, it was literally, can you guys make a project? So we had to figure our own problem out. And we started to think about really what is the VNA and how do you draw your attention to the VNA? And there's this original entrance. So this is like the courtyard. The door at the bottom is the old entrance to the museum. And above the entrance is this thing that says, uh, it's sort of, uh, proverb that says better is to get wisdom than gold and we really love this idea that in general that buildings try and communicate to you and they try and communicate their like most essential thing um, and it really is like you know this was inscribed into the building and therefore the building talks to you right I mean we're kind of used to it but it's like if you really think about it it's quite quite great so we had this idea that we'd like to kind of continue this idea, to con continue this conversation that the building or the museum was having with you. Worth noting is that these were literally um, thought of as three programs that we would iron and therefore give to individuals. The idea was that we would commission a, a friend of ours who's a theatre script writer to come up with a kind of play about um, the museum and the museum explaining more to you. So. Um, I, I won't read it because, in fact, I'll tell you what happened to this project in a minute. But basically, uh, we, ha we designed and um, worked on collaboratively with the scriptwriter three different plays. Each one of those plays somehow picked another aspect of the museum to communicate. So the first one was thought of as Old Albert, as in the Victoria and Albert. The second was uh, the Romans that occupied the Trajan's column. So these is, this is a conversation between the Romans on the column. And the third was a conversation between Fame, who's a sculpture that exists on the top of the museum, and, in a way, the rest of the museum. It's pretty abstract, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's really um, about literally activating the museum. Um, and these went down really well. I mean, people picked them up and they would read them, and, and over the few weeks that they were given out, they, you know, people were, like, really, like, uh, enjoyed the idea of the, the play. So the director came back to us and he said, could you um, create an actual play out of this? So we went about commissioning an actress and um, we chose a site in the museum which is like this place called the Cast Courts with these amazing Renaissance 
sculptures and bits of details of buildings. Um, and the actress, um, Amelia, acted the play. And I can, I can play a script. This is the scene here. And I think, oh, I haven't got volume, have I? OK, I won't play the script. In Let me ask you to the, the sound for a second. I could come back to this, maybe. But to be honest, you can also look at this on our, um, on our website afterwards. It's very hot in here. I've got a microphone attached to me. It's like having a drip. I think I'll just carry on, because there's a couple more projects here, this is just to mention. In fact, this is the last, the last project to talk about. But basically, I talked at the beginning about In Other Words. And In Other Words was the first project that we did as a studio. And at, the, at that time, In Other Words was very much about um, reviving words in the English language and, and practicing them. And recently, we found that when we're making books with different curators or artists, that there's not always a publisher available. Like, the book isn't, has an uh, infrastructure. Um, so we decided uh, about a year ago to start to revive In Other Words and to start the imprint again proper. And this is the first book that we've, we've published uh, with an artist called Foss. And it's a book for an artist about a collection of his objects that relate to, the co to a common language. And basically, the, the idea with, with Foss is that he's, he's working a lot with uh, installation and, in a way, um, he works a lot with this idea of performative space. So he makes installations and, and has, um, has audiences kind of gather around different individual sculptures or installations or light or movie or whatever necessary, actually, to engage in, in ideas about language. And with this project, he came to us with just a selection of content. Stuff that he'd made for various installations, like some of these things are, for instance, he's been working a lot with Celine, who are, you know, the fashion brand Celine. And for instance, the object at the top, you see this sort of long object. It's like a um, door handle, in fact, for a, the Celine store. But other objects are like really, really big, and maybe you were the center of a sculpture. And, the thing was that he gave us all these objects and he never really explained even the scale of these things. They were just given to us. And he, it, it seems sort of so abstract at this, to say it, but it, he kind of just wanted to make a book out of these, these things. So we had to work out how to make sense of it. And he talked about the idea that each of these objects somehow were like words within a sentence and maybe what we needed to do is work out how to like create, make sense of these words, which is like kind of abstract as hell. Um, still is abstract, actually, thinking about it. I mean, what he does to make sense of these works is creates kind of cabinets for them and positions different ones. And when he talks about this, he talks about the idea that it's maybe expressing a particular idea. So one thing's talking to another. And these are, like, therefore, like, conversations, in a way. So we thought the idea then that the book should be a conversation and, and could have every attribute associated with a conversation is a, 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 gr a good idea. So we, we thought to make the book square, a little bit like his, his works are square. And then we just literally were really led by um, aesthetics in a way, like uh, led by the way things work together. Uh, you can see like repetition starts to occur. That was this idea that certain times, like in a conversation, there's like repetition. Or sometimes when someone's saying something to you, it's a little bit like you've heard it before. It's a kind of deja vu aspect. So there's this sense in the book of like deja vu or repetition or utterance or iteration. And um, that's, that's what creates the book. I mean, that's what creates the expression of the book. Afterwards, as a graphic designer, you have to make all of the formal decisions, like how do you bind the book, how do you print it, how do you make sense of the, the budget in relation to the object. And as a publisher, importantly, you have to think about how do you sell it and how do you price it and how do you communicate it and how do you sort of throw an amazing like launch party for it. 
which is the best bit, sort of. Although you kind of end up waiting in the bookshop going, is this really a good idea to launch a book? I mean, um, in the end, it always makes sense. But, you know, if anyone ever holds a party, they know what I mean. You always wait somewhere at the beginning. You're like, well, is anyone going to come? Um, and I, I could show you, I've got one more project. Has everyone had enough? Or did, should we go one more project? One more project? One more project? <laughs> I'm really hot, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, everyone watching this internationally on the stream is hot in here. Um, so this is the, the latest thing that we've published and it's available on our website. So I'm plugging it because, you know, as a publisher, I have to do that. Um, but this is a collectible edition of an artist collection of collectible editions. Um, and this is a second project we did with Jonathan Monk, in fact, or the third... Se second project we did with Jonathan Monk and basically we, we said to Jonathan we've got a publishing imprint we'd love to make something with you we, we love working with you the first time around and he's like I, I see you, you guys like you want to create collectible editions well I've got a collectible edition and you could make a book about a publication about that so that's why it came to be he told us this on a Skype where he showed us his editions it's quite nice to work as a publisher in this case because you really have no, it's like, it's like uh, you, you're kind of like um, placed in this position, especially with artists in a way, like a merciful position where you just don't know what's going to happen and you know that you're going to be led by the artist because that's the whole point. So we were like, hoping it's going to be a great set of objects when he started to show it to us. And in fact it was, it was he basically collects Kippenberger editions. So what we thought about doing with these Kippenberger editions is kind of, we were kind of, when we were looking at them, we kind of wanted to see them all together. A, a regular codex format isn't great for that because you can't really see them all together because you'd have to tear the book up. Um, so we basically ha always had this idea to want to make a pack of playing cards. And I think this moves, yeah. So basically what we did is we created a photograph, life size, of these Kippenberger editions laid out. This is quite snazzy, keynote. Um, and we basically, it's really straightforward, I mean, it's, you know, I don't even need to explain it. We laid it out full size. We put a cigarette and a foot in there because, um, you know, that helps you realise, in case the beer can and the watch didn't. And we laid it out. The way, way playing cards are made, it's like, and there's a thing with playing card editions, is that the collectors of playing cards, who are like really avid collectors, love the uncut sheets. So one of the ideas was that we would have an edition which would be an uncut sheet, which is also available. Um, and then we would simply label this uh, edition based on what it is. And the thing is that it's uncanny because Jonathan also likes Sol Lewis and blunt conceptual art and therefore has a very similar way of captioning his work. So this work is literally a collection of nine Kippenberger editions, one Boetti watch, a cigarette and yellow. And then this is the uh, last thing of the, of the uh, presentation, but this is the promotion of the playing cards. Because you have to, when you're a publisher, you have to think about everything else, right? So we use playing card idioms to create this series. And, uh, oops, I shouldn't have done that. And that's it. That's all I'm going to show you tonight. And, yeah. Questions, preguntas. Quién se anima? Hello, hi. Hi. Sorry for my English, it's not very good. Um, first of all, thanks for sharing all this with us and for opening up a little bit with us. At least this, I like this very much. But 
thanks for sharing all this, but I would like you to share something else with us. Um, one time, some years ago, I decided in design and, uh, and urban art, I just would like to, th to do things for clients and for everything that I would love to do. And uh, sometimes because of the clients, sometimes because of the project itself, it, it's, it's not being very viable. You have to cut everything up and, well, sometimes it doesn't end up as, as well as you want it. And, uh, but sometimes it does. And, uh, and at the end, this is what makes us, make us happy and it makes us go on. I would like to know, if you want to share it with us, which are these pillars for you that at the end, when you finish a project and everything makes like clack, it closes down. What are these things that you are looking for when you end up a project and you said, this is already finished, this is already done. I'm happy with this. What are we looking for at that moment when it's finished? I feel like I've got a smart ass an answer for that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that, that when the project's finished, it's never like, oh, okay, I'm going to go home. Like, you're finished, right? Because these things are all, everything is on top of each other. And it's only really times like this that you get a reflective moment, quite honestly. Uh, so, you know, in the end of a project, quite, quite honestly, and I think everyone should be really good at that as a graphic designer, is you make sure you invoice that thing. <laughs> you, you make sure it's on time and you make sure you make your client aware that they should pay it. I mean, you know, really. Here they always pay late. This is a yeah. very typical thing. It's a really game. important part of the process. You can't just lie there going, I'm oh, so fantastic, I'm such a, so, so, uh, so pleased. Because it's not, you know, in the end, we, we didn't decide, we, we're industrial practitioners, right? And we're making as we go. And we try to learn something from what we do, but we don't have that often to reflect on it. It's often only in the times where, you, where Ollie and I are traveling together, where we have some time to have a conversation and maybe we can start to analyze some projects. Or um, There are the rare cases where a client would be, or a commissioner or a collaborator would be willing to share some feedback. That's a really nice thing. That doesn't happen so often. But when that happens, it kind of makes you reflect and realize what that project was about. Um, but there's an artificial scenario in graphic design, I would say, and maybe in other practices too, but you know, when you solidify these projects as um, part of an archive, they take on a different identity or a different persona. You know, they become, uh, another, they become recontextualized in another way. And that's kind of what, as graphic designers, you end up seeing of other graphic design. You rarely see like a live project and how it really is, you know. I hope that makes sense, but that's quite important, I think. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Any questions? <laughs> So can you tell us a, a bit um, of how, how do you manage your work? So it's you know, two partners, two designers, and a studio manager. A project comes in. Do you share it from the start? Do you split the work? And mm -hmm. how, how, how does it go in, in the studio? It, it always starts with Ollie and I working on it. Yeah. The only time, the only exception of that is if it's already like part of a project which may have existed before like a, an extension of a project or, or a smaller manageable element. We'd, we'd love the idea then that someone would be able to start it. But um, we work with really young, Seb and, and Max are, are really young designers and they're not necessarily ready to uh, start projects on their own. But I feel like they might be watching this, so you will be soon. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ollie and I always start together, for sure, and it's always based in conversation. And, and we try to find out um, what something is, try to make sense of it. It's not always clear. I mean, I can't remember the last time we had a design brief. 
you know, like an actual really thought through brief where someone else had thought about what it is. And, uh, you know, bad briefs are even worse because they lead you in another way and then you have to strategize it and come back. But generally, yeah, you have to start from the beginning and try and work out what it is, what it means, and how can you make it possible within the means. Quite conventional. Yeah. Do you or Oliver have a background on literature or something? Because it's really, you're really good about on writing. <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why we might have a way of handling words, because we're not educated in words, you know. Um, but we're both interested in, in, in reading and, and in, in other forms of literature. Um, but it's not really like, most of the time, for instance, like idioms and, and uh, basic explanations come up a lot in our work and in a sense um, those things aren't necessarily like about um, literature. It's, it's more about uh, blunt meaning um, and about simplicity. Yeah. Yeah, about that, that last word that you say, simplicity. We've heard uh, along the, the, your lecture the word simplicity, functionality, even democracy. So how these words are applied in your everyday work or even in your creative process with your partner? Mm -hmm. Well, democracy for sure, because there's two of us, right? <laughs> um, I mean, do you reject uh, any kind of solution that doesn't fit? in this kind of structure or always you, you think in this process you know naturally in a, in a natural way no not at all and I think this is part of the the thing about recontextualizing the work and re-explaining it because it's not really that simple in, in in the moment it's being made it feels really complicated actually and um, and com and doesn't you don't realize it can be simple um, it's only afterwards when you learn it and you know how to talk about it and you know what it was. In hindsight, it becomes maybe more simple to explain. Like, for instance, Strelka. It's a good example because, yes, afterwards we realized there were these key decisions which were created based on lots of conversations. But um, when we started the project, uh, it, it felt like such a difficult project to deal with. Like they, it, it, you know, it, 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 was, it was complex, really complex. It was really undemocratic in the way they wanted us to tell them everything, you know? Like, they loved democracy, the idea of it, but they weren't willing to tell us anything. Um, and uh, what was the other thing? The functional, I mean, it wasn't functional at all because, you know, we couldn't even really, really understand what they were dealing with, actually. So how could, you know, we make it functional? I think that's why, in the case of Shulker, we relied on, like, basic elements because it needed some sort of grounding to have a future in a way. But yeah, yeah, it's not always like that, I would say, yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering if you ever, as a studio, found yourself in the position where you say, uh, I would really like to take this commission, but we're not ready, like it's too big for us, or something like this. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Good for you. No, I think, I think that the thing is that, that, that running a, a small uh, entity in a big situation, like a big context, is always a little bit uh, frightening. You know, when someone calls you from somewhere else and they have a really, they're a big entity and you have to work out how to make sense of it or even handle it. But um, in, the end, it, in the end, it's really quite a simple process, graphic design. Sorry, I'm using the word simple again. But, you know, it's like, it, it's simple in terms of you need, you know, basic machinery. You don't need so much to design with, to, to make the work. Yeah, but you, if, you, know, if yeah. you get into, I mean, for instance, n now that you're in publishing, now you need to yeah. handle distribution of your yeah, own Yeah, that's work. scary. That is scary. That's, that's very difficult. So. Yeah, and I don't think we realized that before we got into it, actually. I think that's what everyone says, right? But, you know, you deal with it. It's like, luckily Antenna, who we work with, are helping us a lot with that. 
and try and you, you work out how to bring bring in friends or collaborators when necessary. Um, the website world of design is really crazy, you know, technically. And we neither of us, neither Ollie and I program or know anything and can even handle reading code. So, um, you know, we're basically at the mercy of the collaborators in those cases. But we found good people to work with, so we know we can now make complex websites. Um, so I think we have a little bit of trust in the, in the, pro in, in the fact that things will be okay. <laughs> Blind faith. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Pleasure. Hello. Um, if you could give an advice to yourself as a student, what would it be? <laughs> um, I think the most important thing in, in any process is confidence. So the advice would be to find out what you are comfortable with and, and maybe are good at and kind of concentrate on it and, and uh, succeed in it to create confidence. Because confidence is the beginning of the process, right? Once you have confidence, then you can take something onto the next level. So yeah, I think confidence is really important. And that's, um, that's that. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Hot. I, I told them, but that didn't change. That it didn't, didn't cool down. It's okay. Hopefully, I'm going to look sweaty now. Sorry. Can I?